Grand Theft Auto 4 is the ultra-violent open-world game that brought the creative vision of brothers Sam and Dan Hauser into high definition for the first time. With the help of visionary producer Leslie Benzies, writer Rupert Humphreys, and scores of location scouts, artists, and programmers, Rockstar Games would create a near-perfect simulacrum of post-9-11 New York City, complete with incessant fear-mongering, Some local bleeding hearts are whining about freedoms and police brutality, a failing economy, You should have told me how bad things were in this country before I got here, and an influx of Russian mobsters looking to get into the real estate game. Not only does GTA 4 shed a sarcastically critical light on late-stage capitalism in America, its iconic protagonist offers one of the most unique backstories of any character in gaming history. But before we do that, let's respond to the many comments we've received that suggest the highest-selling video game of all time cannot possibly be anti-capitalist. You're wrong. You're just wrong. The Hauser brothers were born in early 1970s London to a well-off lawyer and actress. Smash cut to the mid-90s, where Sam's dad gets him an interview at BMG, where he's able to maneuver a deal to run their failing video game division. He hires his brother and is introduced to Leslie Benzies, head of what was then known as DMA Design. The work done by these individuals and countless other Rockstar employees over the next two decades was handed over to the ironically named Take-Two Interactive to distribute at a profit. A small percentage of that profit is then given back to Rockstar Games. The majority of the profit goes to shareholders like this man, Strauss Zelnick, who led an investor stage takeover of Take-Two in 2007, one year before GTA 4 was released. As of 2021, Sam and Dan Hauser have a net worth of about 150 million each. I got tired of looking up different celebrities, but that's pretty close to the net worth of your favorite basketball player. And just like basketball players, video game developers are talented workers who are being overworked and underpaid by major corporations with a monopoly on their given industry. Both Leslie Benzies and Dan Hauser have left Rockstar Games over payment disputes, the former engaging in a years-long legal battle that was eventually settled out of court. Mr. Benzies then went on to buy a decommissioned church in Scotland, converting it into a short-lived community trust. Are they privileged? Sure. Can privileged people gain class consciousness? Yeah, I think so. The point is, workers should be paid handsomely for their work. If anything, the Housers should be wealthier, as should every single person who helped create those titles. To be anti-capitalist is not to refuse money. It's to demand more from the greedy, shareholding oligarchs that do nothing for the products or people they make their billions off, and to expose them as the manipulative crooks they really are. At the onset, Nico Balik finds himself in Liberty City after a long stint as a mercenary in Eastern Europe. No, wait, that's later. Two off-the-cuff interactions quickly clue us into his heritage. You fucking Ruskies are milking me dry. I ain't a cow. I ain't Russian. And political beliefs. There is no I, there is only we. It is a glorious system, comrade. <laughs> excuse me? You're excused, comrade. You're excused. Now go and mind self for 50 years. <laughs> You're a dick. Why make these distinctions? Well, before the events of the game, Nico was a citizen of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and an active member of the Yugoslav People's Army, one of the many paramilitary organizations that over time fought Nazi, Soviet, and American imperialism in the name of anti-fascism, true communism, and third world liberation. It's important to note that both Nazi Germany and the USSR took direct inspiration from the American imperialist model. This is not a debate. The term third world simply means to not be allied with the US or Russia. After World War II, many established nations sought sovereignty from these two violent world powers, implementing their own versions of progressive economic and social policies. Josip Broz Tito was the charismatic prime minister of Yugoslavia from 1944 until his death in 1980. Starting his career as a communist agitator in the early 1920s, he would go on to found the non-aligned movement with revolutionary world leaders such as Kwame Nkrumah and later Fidel Castro. Under Titoism, socially owned and worker-managed industrial firms competed in open free markets. National interests were focused on defying Soviet hegemony and developing relationships with other autonomous provinces. His passing created immediate economic upheaval, and in the coming years, Yugoslavia would separate into five different nations, abolishing communism completely in 1992, along with most of the world. 
When the Cold War was won by the U.S., it forcibly reasserted capitalism as the only viable choice for these developing nations. This inevitably led to increasing levels of poverty and violence, including the devastating Bosnian genocide, of which Nico's people were the victims. The backstory of Grand Theft Auto 4 quietly educates us as to the desperate choices made by PTSD-riddled freedom fighters after the fall of communism, and the atrocities committed by succeeding capitalist regimes across Eastern Europe. Leftist ideology did not destabilize these nations or displace these people. Capitalism did. Skeptical of the American dream from the jump, Nico finds his brother deeply in debt to Albanian gangsters. Fun fact, when communism fell in Albania in 1992, the new democratic government started a series of pyramid schemes that coerced one-third of the population to sell their property. When peaceful protests were met with gunfire in 1997, the peasant investors turned insurgent and started a revolution that continued until 2001. Fucking Caucasians, am I right? If you love the open-air freedom of San Andreas, Liberty City will legitimately make you uncomfortable. Separated into three sections, the map reimagines New Jersey, Manhattan, and the Brooklyn, Queens area, all with appropriately clever pseudonyms, including Colony Island, Africa Tower, and the Statue of Happiness, featuring the face of vocal hot coffee mod opponent Hillary Clinton. Each borough is initially blocked off due to terrorist activity, which in fact turns out to be a front for various mobsters who have been building international empires since the early 90s. Now some Russian assholes think they can march in and take control of rackets my family has run for 50 years! While not nearly as busy as NYC proper, driving and walking are about as much of a slog as in real life. Streets are short, stoplights are plentiful, and curbs will stop you in your tracks. I honestly get the impression that Rockstar wants you to sit in traffic. Calling a cab will become your main mode of transport, and if you choose not to skip the ride, a plethora of radio stations will turn the game into a fun, interactive screensaver. I'm a brain surgeon. The monotony can really get to you. But thanks to overzealous laws, I can't light up a cigarette or do shots to relax my nerves. With the Alcatine patch, it really lightens the mood especially after an unfortunate patient death. The Alcatine Patch is the same refreshing feeling of 12 beers and a pack of cigarettes all at once. All of these features exist because the entire game encourages restraint. Okay, well, this baseball bat doesn't really encourage restraint, but bear with me. In GTA V, a hammer costs $500. A handgun costs $350. In GTA IV, this baseball bat costs $5. And a pistol costs $600. It is by far the best $5 you can spend, other than giving money to homeless people for health, of course. Most, if not all, close-range combat situations can be resolved with this baseball bat. It's also just very satisfying to hit things with. There are many instances where the game encourages non-lethal solutions. NPCs can be found crouched over and stumbling from non-fatal gunshot wounds, leaving it up to the player whether or not to take out disarmed, defenseless opponents. I give up! I give up! No more! I give up! Please stop! I don't want to die! Just call an ambulance! Please! In one climactic scene, Nico is given the choice to kill a handcuffed, broken man, with the decision resulting in two disparate, yet equally enlightening scenes. Yes, encouraging people not to murder other defenseless people is an act of anti-capitalism. Also, at no point do you ever need to think about money. Three Leaf Clover is by far the hardest and most satisfying mission in GTA 4, and finds Nico escorting some nice Irish boys to a bank robbery in downtown Algonquin. The reward for this epic heist is a cool 250k, which is more money than you will ever need for the rest of the game. This occurs at about 40% total completion. As with the entire Grand Theft Auto series, the purpose of this mission is political education. Early on, it is disclosed that Brother Derek has just returned to the family fold after a good few years in the old country, involved in the struggle. Sort of like you, I'd imagine. Turns out Derek McCreary has been working for the Irish Republican Army, a revolutionary vanguard that has fought British colonial rule for over a century. Quick note, the word Republican in this case just means a group seeking an independent republic. In contrast, Republicans in America want corporations to be independent republics. See the difference? The long drive from Dukes finds the brothers McCreary trading insults about their deepest and darkest secrets, as all good Irish families ought to do. With some of the best voice acting in the game, Derek's words reveal a calm temperament and scientific approach to direct action. Safe to say, what we're using is controllable enough to go through any vault door without incinerating whatever's inside. Not gonna leave much residue on the notes either, so they should be washable. Don't none of you worry about nothing! We're here for the bank's money. It's going to a greater cause. Shut up and handle the safe. Now listen, people. 
We're your friends. I'm trying to be honest with these people. We put them through a lot today. So, well, isn't he a nice young man? You go ahead and rub your bank there, sweetie. Make sure to clean up when you're done. I'm gonna go watch my stories. Call your father if you need anything. Um, also, this part is fucking gold. Hey, yo, I'm a gun club member. I'm gonna take these rookies downtown. Are you with me? Hey, what's your name, son? Luis. But this ain't such a good idea, bro. Yeah? They said catching that pass in my high school championship football game was a bad idea, because I broke my leg in 13 places, but I scored a touchdown and won the game. The world was built out of bad ideas, my friend. Motherfucker! <laughs> fuck! Oh. We told you not to fuck with us! Oh. In Deconstruction for Beginners, wealthy entrepreneur Playboy X hires our anti-hero to take out local union leaders. After attempting to talk him out of it... I don't know how good your plan is, though, Playboy. If I get rid of the guys on the site, then won't there be more? If it's a union problem, doesn't that make it bigger than a few guys with guns? Nico is let in on the prison logic that motivates him. That cat and me is going to be tied as two cellmates on lockdown after this. Now, this is where my father-in-law would say, See? Black people are just as racist as white people. But in reality, this speaks more to the selfish ignorance all successful people are bound to adopt as they make their way up the American social ladder. Which is obviously way fucking harder for people of color, but we're not getting into that right now. Playboy X lives comfortably in a penthouse apartment he bought after inheriting a thriving business from his mentor. Instead of taking care of those who helped him get there, he's deeply insecure and looks to wealthy industrialists for approval. In the end, there is no big payout for the Bellix. Justice is served, but nothing changes. The traumatic decisions and actions of the living remain, as do the systems that encourage patriarchal brutality and greed over communal investment and support. Well, Nico, that was a whole lot of effort for no fucking reward. Story of my life. It is the story of a lot of lives, Becky. I'm getting you used to hearing something. it. As we mentioned in GTA V's anti-capitalist message, Nico's voice actor Michael Hollick was unceremoniously paid $100,000 for his contribution to the game that made half a billion in its first two weeks on the market. Many are also aware that Vladimir Mashkov's performance in the 2001 film Behind Enemy Lines was a prime inspiration for the character. In this interview, he admits to working directly with Rockstar on the project. When asked why he chose to pass on the voice work, his response is telling. Я очень рад, что эта игра собрала за месяц полмиллиарда долларов. Это мы идет разговор о GTA 4, и они использовали мой образ из картины Джона Мура под названием "Behind the в тылу врага". Им понравилось такое. Я очень старался, собирал по кусочкам этот бомжеватый вид, и мне не сказали тогда, что Что это такое? Может быть, я озвучил, но не знаю. Но это интересно, часть профессии, но не особенно меня это увлекает. Но отказались, что что, не интересно? Ну как-то да. Я даже не знал, что это. Я не принял это всерьез. А то, что я мимо очень денег люблю игры. То, что мимо денег ничего. Не, я не переживаю. Я так вот скажу. Все, вот а... эти деньги, они все равно ко мне не имели никакого отношения. In short, Mr. Mashkov is a real fucking actor and has too much integrity to sit in a booth and read lines for scraps. This guy played Rasputin for fuck's sake. GTA San Andreas, which I have downloaded and am very excited to make a video about, assuming the world doesn't end, features Samuel Jackson, Chris Penn, Ice-T, David Cross, Peter Fonda, Charlie Murphy right off the heels of Chappelle Show, and the list goes on. GTA 4 features no actors of note. By the time GTA 5 was being cast in 2009, the industry knew what was up, and Rockstar had to find actors that would take a shit deal and smile about it. Sean Fontano, Ned Luke, and Stephen Ogg's performances in GTA V are Oscar-worthy. There's no doubt about that. But as shark cards continue to rake in billions for Take Two, these three make their money appearing at conventions. And man, do they seem to have the energy for it. Stephen, can you curse at me? Like say, Diego, go fuck yourself or something? <laughs> <laughs> This USA Today article informs us that the three leads were unemployed and seeking to reinvigorate their careers when they got the offer. They would spend the next three years on the project, and rumors suggest the pay rate was on par with their predecessors. Even at 200k a person, twice what Michael Hall had got, that's 66k a year for full-time motion capture and voiceover work. Before taxes. Fuck that. In closing, we leave you with this lovely ad for the Liberty City Police Department. Argue the values and intentions of the game all you want, 
But at the end of the day, at least we can all agree that blue lives don't matter. Good night and good luck. My name is Brian O'Toole. I wanted to fight the war on terror, but I don't read so good. Most careers were closed to me. That's why I joined the LCPD. Now I'm on the front lines, helping tourists and fighting terrorists. I rifle through people's bags on the subway to protect freedom. I arrest protesters at political conventions for straying outside the free speech zone. Being a cop used to be about stopping crime. Now thanks to politicians, it's about fighting terrorists, one old lady at a time. I'm protecting freedom, whatever the cost. I'm a hero, and I know it.